A new generation of leaders seek solutions to protect the planet. When countries, continents, the globe comes together to tackle one singular problem, things that we can do in such a short time are really, really quite unprecedented and just completely amazing. To help confront extreme weather conditions in Europe. The pérdida de diversidad de cultivo. He visto cambios de pérdida de vegetación natural. He visto ríos bajar de caudal. Los ríos que no se secaban secarse en verano y que se secan. Affecting rich and poor nations alike. In November, we'll reach this level. The biggest problem is that is salt water. The salt destroys everything. Young people are renewing the urgency to tackle climate change. I am just a little bit optimistic about meeting what the Paris Agreement set out to achieve by 2050. Before is too late. Zero Hour, Climate Change in Europe, next. to be able to travel around the world. And my experience is that the lack of awareness is the same everywhere. In an emergency, you change your behavior. If there is a child standing in the middle of the road and cars are coming at full speed, you don't look away because it's too uncomfortable. You immediately run out and rescue that child. And without that sense of urgency, how can we, the people, understand that we are facing a real crisis. el laboratorio donde trabajo habitualmente y el objetivo de mi proyecto de tesis es fabricar un material que sea capaz de capturar cantidades relevantes de CO2 directamente de la atmósfera. Elizabeth Martínez studies material science and applied chemistry at the University of Barcelona. El material que yo hago es una combinación de Metal Organic Framework, que es un material tridimensional formado por ligandos orgánicos que contiene cationes metálicos en sus huecos potenciales. Se hacen llamar MOVs y lo combino con óxido de grafeno. Cuando se combinan es posible obtener un material con unas propiedades beneficiosas para absorber gases, en concreto el dióxido de carbono. El hecho de activar las muestras vendría a ser similar a cuando tenemos una esponja que está llena de agua y la estrujamos para eliminar toda el agua que tiene ella y poder eh, volver a utilizarla. Entonces cuando dejamos de apretar la esponja queda vacía de agua. Una vez tenemos la esponja vacía, por así decirlo, sería introducirle CO2 con el objetivo de evaluar la eficiencia del material que hemos sintetizado. El siguiente paso sería adaptarlo a diferentes prototipos y que pueda distribuirse en puntos estratégicos en los que sea capaz de capturar cantidades relevantes de CO2. Cuando no estoy trabajando, normalmente salgo con mis amigos. Durante la semana intento hacer un poco de ejercicio y entre las cosas que suelo hacer es salir a patinar. Me relaja bastante y me ayuda a gastar esa energía que me sobra un poco al final del día. 
El cambio climático sí que me preocupa porque de día a día lo estamos viendo en las noticias, cada vez hay más situaciones catastróficas, la desertificación, el deshielo de los polos, la extinción de muchas especies del planeta, cada vez esto va más y no va a parar, necesitamos una solución inmediatamente. Andalucía, southern Spain, the cradle of the country's world-famous olives. These trees are a testament to hundreds of years of tradition. But something new is afoot. A desert is slowly encroaching, creeping up from Africa as the planet warms. The days are hotter, less and less rain is falling. And when it does, it's torrential. Flash floods carry away topsoil. According to one study, as much as three quarters of the Iberian Peninsula could become desert by the end of the century if mankind fails to control greenhouse gas emissions. Farmers here can't stop climate change on their own. They can only try to adapt. They must, and quickly, says olive grower Agustín Bermejo. La práctica de dejar esa cubierta vegetal Es correcta porque estás procurando materia orgánica al suelo y estás procurando un freno a la escorrentía de la agua, pero luego a la hora de controlarla vaya a ver como la máquina la pegan demasiado al suelo y lo que hacen es romper la capa superficial del suelo y hacerlo polvo. ¿Cómo queda el suelo después del paso del tractor? Se produce una compactación por el mismo efecto de los martillos y una rotura toda la, la estructura de, del suelo, de la capa superficial lo cual hace que se incremente la tasa de correntía y se reduzca la tasa de infiltración. Ese es el sumidero de carbono, ese es el, el efecto de almacenamiento de esos gases de efecto invernadero que tenemos y que tantos quebraderos de cabeza nos están dando y que potencialmente tan positivos serían si se hiciese un manejo de las cubiertas vegetales con otro criterio Es fácil ver cómo la cubierta vegetal se va transformando en materia orgánica de una forma sencilla, cavando un poquito por aquí. Lo que vamos teniendo es materia orgánica en descomposición que se va incorporando al suelo y se va enriqueciendo. But this is industrial olive production. Here in the province of Jaén alone, there are now 66 million olive trees. For harvesting, it's faster to just scrape the soil bare. But farming based on growth and profit alone, says Bermejo, is no longer possible on our warming planet. Creo que el problema está arriba. Creo que el problema está en, en los poderes a nivel político, en, en los grandes poderes que manejan esta sociedad, que están muy influidos por los lobbies también de las grandes compañías. Nos quieren transmitir la percepción de que es necesario un gran crecimiento económico, que si no hay crecimiento económico parece que, que, que nada funciona y que todo es un desastre. But more and more world leaders seem to agree with Bermejo, at least judging from their words. Bermejo is heartened, but also disheartened, because their message is dire. We stand indeed at the edge of the abyss. Already people are dying in big numbers. Farms are failing. Millions face displacement. We have a small and narrow window of opportunity to do the right thing. The UN's latest scientific assessment released this summer is just as blunt. Humanity is facing a code red emergency, an irreversible tipping point. Catherine Potvin is a plant biologist and professor at McGill University. Way back in the 1980s, I started to read uh, results of models that would say what would happen to the planet if climate change was real and if we kept putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that was very frightening. It's never stopped to be frightening. And it's even more frightening now because it's happening. Since pre-industrial times, the average global temperature of Earth has increased by a little more than one degree Celsius. Oh, 
Niger aligns itself with the statements of Egypt on behalf of Africa. And as another option, l'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. To help stop the rising temperatures, in 2015, nations negotiated the UN Paris Agreement. I now declare the Paris Agreement for Climate Change open for signature. It's becoming a reality a year later. It's a legally binding international treaty that includes commitments from all countries to reduce their emissions to lessen the impacts of climate change. Catherine previously served as an advisor at UN climate conventions. So I think the Paris Agreement was a real success and they've really learned from Copenhagen and what I found extremely intelligent and astute from the French uh, delegation that was managing that conference is they gave full responsibilities to countries who were not so happy. For example, Bolivia was charged with overseeing forests. And Bolivia had a very strong opinion on forests. But they became a central actor to get a an agreement. And so basically, instead of trying to muzzle them, they, gave, they empowered them. And by empowering them, they looked for this decision. And clearly, the agreement of Barack Obama with China ahead of the Paris conference with agreement on what those two countries would do together was fundamental because you had the two biggest emitters in the world, you know, together looking at what you want to do. But at the current rate of warming, climate scientists say the planet could exceed two degrees Celsius as early as 2030. If the UN's message is to act, Bermejo and colleagues are at least trying. He and biologist Fernando Bautista traverse a nearby mountainside once covered by trees. They were felled a generation ago. But because the region's grown drier, little has grown back here. Claro que he visto cambios. He visto cambios de homogenización de, del territorio, de pérdida de diversidad de cultivo. He visto cambios de pérdida de vegetación natural. He visto ríos bajar de caudal. Los ríos que no se secaban secarse en verano y que se secan. This unlikely spot is Europe's front line against the encroaching desert. The foot soldiers, thousands of tiny saplings of juniper, oak, and pine. Ahí, en la esquina. Ah, sí. Pero se está peligrando. Sí, pero está vivo. Pero lo veo feote, ¿no? Sí, tal vez, pero bueno. Vamos a darle un voto de confianza. The trees have been planted randomly to mimic a real forest. Today's work, counting how many have survived their first three months in the ground. Son plantitas pequeñas que vienen de alveolo, tienen que extender sus raíces, tienes que darle tiempo para afianzarse en la tierra, pero puede ser que hasta octubre o noviembre no caiga ni una sola gota. Hemos hecho un conteo que tenemos unas muy buenas perspectivas porque estamos rondando el 95% de supervivencia. The idea here isn't just to mimic a forest, but to create a new one, says Alveval, the NGO behind this project. A green belt running for hundreds of miles across Spain's south. A natural sponge for absorbing CO2. And trapping humidity, leading to more rain, boosting biodiversity, and helping keep topsoil in place. Si perdemos un milímetro de suelo, un solo milímetro en toda esta superficie y se va por esa vaguada, el barranco abajo hasta la rambla y de la rambla al Mediterráneo, eso ningún ser humano de los que hay ahora mismo en el planeta va a volver a, a verlo recuperarse. The task here looks daunting, but there's inspiration close by. A juniper tree more than 1000 years old de los más antiguos de su especie que, que podemos encontrar eh, en esta zona. Es un superviviente. Posible potencial a esta zona siempre y cuando esta especie sea capaz de eh, afrontar esos picos del clima. Y esperemos que en los posibles escenarios de cambio climático que pueden ocurrir en el futuro sea una de las especies que, que sobreviva. Predictions of extreme weather in today's Europe, many would say it's already here.
in Spain's northeastern region of Catalonia, there were a record 51 forest fires in July alone. This one swept quickly up a bone-dry mountainside, consuming thousands of hectares, threatening villages. Si te fijas, el humo ya sale de, de la parte de aquí. Hasta ayer, el humo venía, estaba detrás. Y ahora el humo ya está en la parte nuestra. Ayer por la noche estu, estaba en toda la carena, es decir, en todo lo que vemos como sierra que se ve hasta allí abajo. Esto significa unos 8 o 9 kilómetros de flanco. Este aire le llamamos marinada y es un aire que viene de sur a norte. Y claro, el sur está detrás de la montaña. El problema era que saltara la carena y si saltaba la carena y con el viento nos podía llegar a venir aquí en el pueblo. As the fire grows, this farming town braces for the worst and mobilizes. Fire brigades fell nearby trees as helicopters dropped water on the still distant flames. But the fire leaps the ridge. The heat and the wind whip it down the mountainside at startling speed. Time to go, Armando. Farmers desperately till their fields closest to town, hoping to create a last ditch fire break. As the sun goes down, the hope is that the flames will subside. But so far this summer, across the Mediterranean, from France to Algeria, from Greece to Turkey, temperatures have not cooled enough, even at night. Record wildfires have burned out of control. In many places, locals and tourists have been forced to flee for their lives. But the continent's most damaging fires rage far from sight, in the far north of Siberia. Here, nearly three million hectares have burned this summer. That's an area the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island, and the fire season is far from over. Dousing these massive blazes with water is a waste of time, says firefighter Stanislav Cherkashin. <laughs> Cherkashin is one of just a few dozen men working day at night to contain the flames. Control fires like these burn up vegetation in a wildfire's path, robbing it of fuel. If there's nothing to burn, the big blaze will go out. But today the wind is blowing erratically, making even the controlled burn unpredictable. Короче, ветер у нас очень сильный. Ночью даже не утихает. Мешает работе. Пожар очень быстро идет. Поэтому вот днями и ночами работаем. Уже, ребята уже устали мои группы мои уже очень устала. Приходится работать, делать. 
Это наша работа. Дождей нету. Сейчас вот в лесу сухая трава еще. Вот это сухая трава, как порох горит. Ну и это народу не хватает. Народу очень мало, мало пожаров. Много, большие пожары сейчас все. Ну для животных, для птиц это тоже плохо. И же это дом родной. Как говорится, душа болит за нашу родную тайгу там. После этого пожара там лес, наверное, думаю, восстановится. Ну, понадобится 20-30 лет, даже больше, наверное. Вот эти деревья, все это сгорит. Там один гарь останется. Вот деревни, вот местные там на зиму дрова готовят. Вот уже нет ничем, нынче будет готовить дрова. Сена тут сгорело, много сена. Коров надо зимой как-то кормить. Тяжело будет зимой, думаю. Hard for farmhands like 65-year-old Vladimir Bachkerev. Oh, утром я встал, пять часов. Дым, дымище здесь черное, и это пепел постоянно летит. Потом где-то к утру, второму часу, наверное, такой гул стоял. Я думаю, мы думаем, вертолет идет. А каждый это огонь верховой. И такой сильный ветер от него. Ветер. A crown fire is when the tops of the trees burn, as opposed to the undergrowth. They're harder to control. Там все на костики уже оттуда бежали. Там 20 километров самые самые вообще на костные воде у нас 300 гектаров. Вот я оттуда ребят уехал. A mí me gusta mucho la naturaleza, pasear por la montaña y es esa conexión que siento con la naturaleza, lo que quiero proteger también y que se mantenga. Ana Mas Herrador estudia Chemical Engineering at the Polytech University of Catalonia. Paso el día en el laboratorio intentando simular el proceso natural de una hoja de la fotosíntesis y después llego aquí por la tarde y me siento otra vez que estoy en el mismo lugar e intentando entender cómo funciona para después aplicarlo en el laboratorio. Yo creo que está un poco encima ya el cambio climático aquí, pero yo creo que es posible llegar a, a una solución. En cuanto, por ejemplo, a la generación de, de CO2, mi proyecto se basa en captar en las emisiones de CO2. El dispositivo que hemos diseñado funciona con unas membranas la tecnología de membranas facilita eh, la transferencia de masa entre los dos medios, el gas y el aire. Después tenemos la disolución absorbente, que conjuntamente con una enzima, que es la hidrasa carbónica, capta y convierte el CO2 en carbonatos. Actualmente estamos intentando mejorar la, la eficacia de, del dispositivo para aumentar la concentración de CO2 que se capta. La idea de mi proyecto es acabar diseñando un equipo que puedas tener en, en casa, por ejemplo, y acabar capturando el CO2 y obteniendo un producto final en el que se pueda reutilizar y esté dentro de una economía circular. En Barcelona ahora hay ciertos días del año siempre hay episodios de contaminación en los que no se puede circular.
yo cuando era pequeña esto no, no lo solía ver. Pero ahora cada año hay más episodios así. También hay más temporales marítimos. Hay más lluvias intensas también, son más frecuentes. No es la única solución, sino que también debemos centrarnos en reducir las emisiones y en reducir nuestro consumo. La ciencia es muy complicada, muy cambiante, siempre tienes que estar informándote y estar al día. Y también puede ser que nos salga bien a la primera, a la segunda y a la tercera, pero yo creo que el conocimiento es muy importante compartirlo. Across the subarctic and arctic, warmer temperatures are melting glaciers and snow caps at a pace never seen. More than 3,000 kilometers to the south, the threat against the ancient Italian city of Venice grows each year. Higher seas lead to floods like this one in 2019. A tidal surge driven by storm winds put parts of the city under six feet of water. In the last 10 years, Venice has flooded 110 times. The city hasn't witnessed such onslaught since the Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century. Venice's 9th century basilica is a victorious testament to time and travail. But its substructure is no match for the enemy at hand, salt. La chiesa è una costruzione in laterizio rivestita dentro e fuori da esilissimi spessori di marmo, 3 cm circa. L'acqua salata, o meglio i sali apportati dall'acqua con l'evaporazione cristallizzano, aumentano sempre di più, si concentrano sempre di più nelle murature e nella cristallizzazione aggrediscono i marmi, le pietre, le pavimentazioni e così via. Chief architect Mario Piana oversees the painstaking multi-million dollar yearly repairs to the temple. Progress is slow, the work often dashed overnight, because the basilica sits at the lowest end of Venice on St. Mark's Square. The cost of the maintenance and restauration of this extraordinary complex is not forgotten, for example, that there are more than 100 types of different pieces of marble that have been used in the construction of the temple, that the church, just to give a few numbers, a circa 700, quasi 750 colonne, colonne vere, non le piccole colonnine, che ha 8500 quasi metri quadri di mosaici. Tutti gli esperti danno come quasi inevitabile un innalzamento ulteriore e sempre più preoccupante dei livelli marini rispetto a quelli terrestri. Le città costiere sono particolarmente esposte a questo problema e dovrebbero guardare a Venezia. Dovrebbero guardare a Venezia perché Venezia è in una delle condizioni peggiori dal punto di vista della condizione del rapporto tra la terra e il mare. The damage from flooding isn't just hurting Venice's iconic structures, it's derailing the lives of normal citizens, like shop owner Claudio Vernier. The, the biggest problem is uh, that is salt water. So the salt destroys everything. And the salt uh, continues to grow in half on the walls until seven meters, also when the water is not. And the salt destroys everything. In November, we'll uh, reach uh, this level. The 2019 flood cost Vernier some $60,000 in cleanup and repairs, but he says the money isn't the real issue. It's the uncertainty that's killing him. It's uh, really dangerous for our mind because uh, every, every day you, you, can't, you, you, you can't know how it will be the next. We live here, but we want also to do business. It's a problem because uh, you can't uh, uh, not only image, uh, but uh, make a good programmations 
of the steps of your work because it's possible that something will happen and destroy everything you will doing that you will doing in, in since that moment and the flooding threat only worsens since october last year 21 abnormally high tides have surged in but there's good news only one surge actually flooded the city the rest were blocked by moses Venice sits atop a semi-protected lagoon, connected to the Adriatic Sea by three narrow channels. When the tides surge, water rushes through the channels, leading to the flooding. But since last year, inflatable barriers have been blocking the surges with remarkable success. The one-of-a-kind system is called Mosa, or Moses in English. After more than three decades and some six billion dollars invested, Moses is finally holding the waters at bay. We are at the northern entrance of Lido Treporti. It is a gap of 420 meters, 6.5 meters in depth. Here we have 21 caissons, 20 meters each that can be elevated just injecting the air inside the caisson. They can come up independently one of the other. In case of an extreme flooding, you can uh, uh, keep uh, three meters at sea and one meter in the lagoon. It's very simple. Just in half an hour, the barrier can come out of the water because these caissons are below the water all the time waiting to be elevated. This was Moses' first real run last October. Residents long skeptical of the mega project applauded. Among them was Jana Zanda, co-owner of the aptly named Aqua Alta, or High Water, bookstore. Each time her shop floods, she has to stack all her low-placed volumes on tables and higher shelves. They stopped a lot of times uh, during the last decade uh, because there were no money enough uh, and uh, something went wrong with the construction. So, you know, Venetian people, I think, uh, didn't believe that it could actually work. And we saw it uh, at work for the first time in 2020. So we said, okay, last year it was terrible. Now we can face what's happening right now. And it worked. And we were all shocked by that. Because, you know, we waited so long uh, that we were beginning to consider it kind of a myth, a legend, something that doesn't really exist. And so, yeah, at the end I was happy it worked. Venice officials are so pleased with Moses, in fact, that they're suggesting coastal cities worldwide consider building their own floating tide barriers. Pierpaolo Campostrini is with Venice's Water Authority. For instance, in the Lake Pochatrain in New Orleans, there will be, would have been a system like this. New Orleans would not have suffered from the flooding. So in many places of the world with the necessary adaptation, a, a similar concept uh, can be used. New Orleans was just pummeled by Hurricane Ida, a Category 4 storm in August. Ida made landfall 16 years to the day after Hurricane Katrina devastated the city. In the interim, New Orleans had upgraded its hundreds of miles of traditional above-water levees and dikes. They held up against Ida's 150 mile an hour winds. But Campostrini says a submerged barrier, like Moses, offers another advantage less impact during calm weather on ship movement, normal tidal flows, and on natural ecosystems. This is much more modern, much more uh, environmental friendly than simply putting a dike, closing uh, the entrance uh, from the sea into the, uh, into the land. More environmentally friendly, but not perfect. Closing off lagoons, even for a short period of time, can cause the water inside to stagnate damaging flora and fauna. Moses only deploys during the highest of tides, but scientists like Jane Damosto say those surges are key to a lagoon's health. The ecology of the lagoon and the health of the city of Venice depends on 
exchanges between the lagoon and the sea. So you can't close Mose an unlimited number of times because then all the organisms and the chemical processes in the lagoon get blocked. Life in Venice atop a stagnant, lifeless lagoon would be inviolable. So the goal is to save both the city and its host. Authorities and scientists are watching closely to see if Moses can pull it off. But even if it does, this groundbreaking tidal barrier could eventually become useless if climate change isn't mitigated. Mose uh, last year helped us uh, for 20 times. It's not finished. It's uh, an experimental. <laughs> As, uh, we hope uh, it will be a good solution, but uh, we know that uh, it's not the solution for always because uh, the uh, uh, sea level we know uh, is, uh, is uh, growing up and uh, the Mose we will work uh, for um, really high tide. But uh, the problem is uh, that uh, that one is not uh, made uh, to work uh, so many times during the year and not to work for so many hours during uh, a day. So uh, it's uh, just at the beginning of the problem. To stop seas from rising more, greenhouse gas emissions need to be drastically slashed and fast. But judging by the number of fossil fuel burning cruise ships vying for entry here, Damosto says humanity is losing ground. As an environmental scientist, one never considers any issues as, as separate from each other. So, of course, the cruise ships represent um, an industry that should be obsolete in consideration of the climate crisis. And Venice is one of the most vulnerable places in the world to climate change issues. Echoing UN Chief Antonio Guterres, Damosto says the longer we wait to act, the more it will cost. If we do decide to save Venice, huge interventions, much more costly and impacting, are going to be necessary. And there's going to be a, a time when global citizens will need to decide whether it's appropriate to be spending resources on saving Venice for all its cultural, artistic, architectural heritage and its unique history, or to spend billions saving huge areas of the world where there's much larger populations that are affected by climate change, sea level rise, extreme events. I don't want to be making that decision I don't think anybody should be making that decision in isolation. It's a collective decision that will need to be made. When I climb, there are often times where I can't do the climb, come to the problem. And when I sort of reach a dead end or when I'm stuck on something on the wall, I would tend to try to come back down, put myself at a distance from the problem and then look at the whole, whole route again to see if there's something wrong with my approach. Christina Kong studies materials science at Imperial College of London. I feel like the resilience that you get from climbing really applies in the sort of uh, research scenario as well because when you do an experiment, especially when it's something that's never been done before, more times than not <laughs> the experiments don't work and you just have to have faith, keep trying and Similarly, sometimes distance yourself away from the problem to really look at what's going on, why this particular thing didn't work, why the entire process needs tweaking. 
So right now I'm just going to um, put my substrates that I've made uh, back into the glove box to make sure it doesn't degrade in air. And I've just turned down the vacuum pump. This is an environment uh, filled with nitrogen gas. Flammable and toxic materials are kept away from oxygen, which is a potential cause of fire, but also to stop some of the raw materials from degrading. In my case, I'm trying to produce a different material uh, for the photovoltaic cell. So my uh, material would be antimony and sulfur. So both of these materials are really abundant um, on Earth and they're very low toxicity to use. So it's perfect if we can get it to work. So now that I've got my um, device out of the glove box, um, it's got all the layers, including the gold electrodes on top. I'm going to test it with the setup, which is for designed for indoor lighting. One of the use cases for um, the indoor solar cells that we're developing that most people would have seen is probably for these calculators. As you can see, this is a small solar panels. And actually, these are just amorphous silicon, which work better outdoors than indoors. So the indoor efficiency of these materials is around just under 10%. So they're not the best efficient. The materials that we're developing, um, our collaborators have made uh, predictive calculations um, to suggesting that it will go up to around 44%. Even if we can get up to half of the predicted value, 20% would still be a massive boost to the existing technology. Um, in turn, we can power um, get the calculators more effectively or even other smaller electric appliances, such as a Bluetooth um, signal transmitter, um, a radio frequency identification tag. The device that we're making has its advantage over lithium ion batteries because we're replacing the need to use lithium altogether. Instead, of we're using more earth abundant elements and the entire um, chain from source to production of lithium is very energy intensive. The mining of the lithium is causing a lot of issues. Uh, so this is a very small step in the right direction to eliminate uh, the needs for lithium in very small ways possible. I am worried about climate change because we're already seeing the adverse effects that it's bringing upon us. The scientific equivalent of falling off of a, a rock in the climbing wall would be probably because you didn't really understand the hole that you were going for. You didn't understand how it's laid out. So when you grab it, you don't have good enough of a grip on it. So I guess in experiments is that you try to devise an experiment, but you didn't really understand why this is done the way it is. So in climbing, you do get up back up and try again. I am just a little bit optimistic about meeting what the Paris Agreement set out to achieve by 2050, provided that all the countries, governments um, still work collectively to tackle the issues and everyone starts to treat this as a serious problem and bring it higher up on their priority list, then I think that might be a solvable issue. Across the continent and the world, flash floods are damaging property and claiming lives in places people thought safe. The cause of the extreme floods, in part climate change, Warmer seas pump more energy into storm clouds and hurricanes like Ida. That car started floating! Yo! This is what climate change looks like, guys. This is what climate change does. But is it too late? Renewables are gaining ground, but the transition is far from complete. And sometimes the intended solution creates a problem. These windmill farms is the saving for the climate, and the, but they are also the death for the reindeers and the reindeer herding. 
Sammy reindeer herder Jürgen Stenberg is still searching for his animals for the summer tagging. But the turbines make his job all but impossible. You don't see the reindeers so far away. You have to see them with your ears. But when you come and if you have to move through a windmill farm, you don't hear anything other than the noise of the windmills. So the reindeers, the sound of the reindeers just disappears. And then you, if you go in with 300 reindeers, maybe you come out with 220 or something. The reindeer are also spooked by the windmills. They won't graze within three kilometers of the towers, nor even pass them to reach traditional feeding grounds. Stenberg's son returns without having found the herd. But they've no choice but to keep searching. This is what they do. About the bound you have to the reindeer since, since ancients of the times. As my forefathers started to live with the reindeers. And one thing that is very hard to uh, to put the words on maybe, but uh, it's about the spiritual relation to the land that we are on and also to the animals and that you are a part of it. You're not separated from it. And uh, the reindeers today, they move and walk the exactly same way as they did 1000 years ago, maybe even before humans started to work and live from the reindeer, maybe just hunting or so. The reindeer's use of the land decides how we use the land also. And uh, we can't rule over the nature. Sami Katarina Seva and her family have had more luck than the Stenbergs today. They've herded their animals home. Det är en skjuts eller någonting som alltid har funnits i min släkt och vi har hållit på med det i hundratals generationer så att för mig Det är ju någonting annat än ett vanligt jobb så att säga så att Det är viktigt för mig att kunna föra den traditionen vidare och vara en förebild för mina döttrar så att de förhoppningsvis också Så att i, i vår familj så kretsar allt kring renskjutsen. Jag ser med oro inför framtiden och hur barnen ska kunna fortsätta bedriva renskjutsen för att så på grund av de klimatpåverkan man ser bland annat Det är det att allting hänger ihop. Och det känns väldigt sorgligt. We are trying to develop, install and then operate a network of smart charging storage locker pods across urban areas uh, mainly in the UK and then globally. Gabriel Jung studied mechanical engineering at Imperial College of London. These locker pods themselves will be um, 
effectively locker units wherein people will be able to store their e-scooter and then regardless of what e-scooter is, they'll be able to hook it into the charging system which will send it up to the cloud and be able to uh, smart charge that e-scooter to elongate battery life and hopefully eventually reduce grid electricity strength. It's in the form of a pod that locks uh, simply because the added security of storage is hugely important to them, especially if they're spending a lot of money for them, for example, or just as a personal good that you're leaving on the side of the street. One of the main technical problems that we're tackling is that there is such a variety and model of e-scooters uh, and battery packs that come with them that each have their own proprietary software and interim um, systems between the charger and the actual battery itself. So while we want to get lots of information from the battery, sometimes we need to do a bit of detective work to go around these systems that disguise these voltages and currents from us. And so that's what we're doing today. Today we're testing this scooter model and we're aiming to see if we can run some diagnostics and some initialization programs effectively to bypass these systems and oh, to bypass these uh, protection systems and get those readings that we need to enable our technology to work effectively. So we'll know we've been successful if this machine starts working at all. At the moment there are protections in the machine itself that say if it can't do what it's been told to do, which is effectively supply current to a battery at a certain level, then it'll just shut down because otherwise you'll get a fire. We have a larger founding team, I think, than most, um, and I am hugely grateful for it. I've always thought, uh, and I still think to this day, that if you don't disagree continuously with your founding team, you've got the wrong founders. We disagree continuously and all the time, and it's really not an argumentative disagreement. It's a kind of a, an academic challenge, a technical challenge, a business challenge, a point of view challenge, um, which is absolutely what you need, and it's what you gain. We're really happy actually that we got through this accelerator program called the Greenhouse run by the uh, Centre for Climate Change Innovation. And through this Greenhouse Accelerator we got a little bit of grant funding and we also got access to this amazing space that we're in right now which is the Royal Institute of Science um, and we can use this place as kind of like a hot desking office to support our other laboratory experiments. In order to set a current, Gabby, it needs to know, it needs to set a voltage. Yeah, but how, does it, how, how do you think current flows without voltage? No, no, it does, but the supply will set the voltage, not Yeah, but how do you think the supply will know what voltage to set it to? No, but the whole point is, is it can only send zero volts at the moment. We're at the moment feeding lots of, well, feeding different voltage and seeing if we can increase the voltage level, for example, or um, other, other inputs to effectively see if we can just make this supply give any charge to the scooter. Um, and if it does do that, that's fantastic and we've kind of cracked the code for this one and it's on to the next model. Oh. So the battery's at 40 volts. Wait, that just worked? Yeah. I was actually thought, I thought that would be a lot harder. <laughs> Gotta take the small ones as they come. This is, um, this is great, didn't need to spend three days on it. And that's another model we can put into our system and say, that says, yeah, we can charge this scooter and we can probably smart charge it and probably double the battery life with it. It's a great thing that this test is a success. We've been able to successfully diagnose and charge and bypass the systems on well, what is a scooter made by one of the largest manufacturers of e-scooters. So that's, I mean, it's a really great thing for us and it's really good for us to know that, to have that confidence that we can apply our smart charging and well, we have the ability to diagnose these kinds of scooters. COVID-19 obviously was a big year of change and a big year that boosted carbon reduction a lot simply because people were staying at home and couldn't physically couldn't go outside. And that resulted in about a 7% decrease in general CO2 emissions on that year. The study that I read indicated that we would need to achieve that 7% decrease every single year for the next 10 to 20 years for us to even stay below the um, reported limit, well the reported kind of disaster limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius um, increase in global temperatures. Um, and obviously that's not something that 
well, was ever planned to be done. That's not something that sounds feasible at the moment, but having a look at the last year and the things that we didn't think were feasible. When countries, continents, the globe comes together to tackle one singular problem, even if it is a problem as big as a huge spreading virus or um, climate change, things that we can do in such a short time are really, really quite unprecedented and just, just completely amazing. Andalusian farmer Agustin Bermejo moves optimistically toward the future, counting on new trees to stop the desert. Sami reindeer herder Jorgen Stenberg counts his animals in northern Sweden, as each year their numbers dwindle due to the changing climate. And Siberian firefighter Arsen Petrov does his small part to stop the record blazes, transforming the taiga into tinder. Chemistry student Ana Mas Herrador returns to the forests of Tarragona to find inspiration and to try to understand how leaves absorb CO2. A una persona joven le diría que sí que a pesar de los obstáculos podemos llegar a, a una solución que no es fácil, pero con muchas ganas, trabajo y sobre todo cooperación entre todos. Yo creo que se puede llegar. No se trata de ser perfectos individualmente, sino que cada uno haga un pequeño cambio y llegaremos lejos.